Praise God. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we praise you and thank you for your grace and your mercy upon our lives. We ask for God that you continue to reveal yourself to us and cause us to grow to know you more and more. Father, establish your work upon our lives. Cause us to hear your word, O oh Lord, today. And cause us to be touched, changed, transformed by your word. Let the Holy Spirit, Lord, work in our hearts as we speak in your presence. Come upon our hearts, O oh God, and do your work in us. And Father, it's in our covenant with you to give you all glory, praise, and worship for all that you do in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God, a blessed Father's Day to all of you who are fathers. And uh, we have a special Father's Day message for you. As I think about uh, fathers, and I just got down a few minutes just, just now, on uh, what are those, th- those things that I personally learned from my own father, even though he was not a believer, until the latter days of his life and in fact he went to be with the Lord uh, many years back and he was still a very young Christian. But yet there were some things that I learned from my father and uh, I just got some sure there more than this but they are jotted down what I could remember of him. And it's strange that you may learn a thousand things but when you sit down to try to remember the main things only come to you. Number one, I I learned morality from my father. My father was a very upright man and uh, he doesn't smoke, he doesn't drink and uh, he lived a a very moral life and uh, uh, he not go into a lot of uh, things that perhaps those unbelievers would have gone into. So I learned and uh, there are things that that are not taught but they are caught. And so I, I, I remember that that impressed me. I never told him that it impressed me, but uh, he lived a very moral life. He doesn't smoke, he doesn't drink. And because of that, even though I didn't know Jesus, I don't smoke and I don't drink. Uh, secondly, I learned discipline from him. A very, very disciplined man. And... Uh, if you don't obey him, you will feel it. You will know what you get for disobedience. And uh, he is the chief clerk in the police headquarters in Kuribayu. And uh, being among these policemen, he, he is a very strong but disciplined man. And I learned that you don't play around. There's no, I mean, there's, there's no such thing as playing around. Just like some, maybe some school children, they like to play, uh, uh, run away from school, or they play uh, hide and seek away from school. But I know if I ever do it, I'll get it. Uh, he was a disciplined man, and he taught me to mean business in all that I do. You don't play around, you're serious in life. Uh, number three, he was a hard-working man. Although we didn't w- had much, he came from a uh, 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 slightly below average family and slowly to the time a lot less um, and a lot provided, but uh, he was a hard-working man. He would go faithfully to his job and come back faithfully from his job and uh, always uh, earning a uh, a reasonable income so that all of us could be supported and I'm grateful for that. Fourthly, I learned to enjoy life. Although he looked at it, uh, although he enjoyed life in a way that I would never do it, but well, I could see him enjoy life. And for my father, uh, he enjoyed life by fixing. He likes food just like some of you. <laughs> And uh, some of you love food so much, you're always talking about which restaurant and which restaurant. And uh, and uh, I know some of you do really love food. <laughs> he learned to enjoy life. And, and the times that he loved to do is that he loved to take me out with him. <laughs> and uh, 
and in their life, and of course, here is what he did as an unbeliever. He loves to go out to the supermarket and he loves to uh, see the movies, which I don't because I'm a believer. And uh, I don't think that, uh, that we should be going out there. That doesn't mean that there are no movies that are good, there are some movies that are okay. But uh, I don't think I will go to that place to watch, or rather probably borrow a video or something and watch if there's a really good movie to uh, uh, have for your children or something. But uh, uh, although I may not agree with uh, the way he likes to eat and uh, uh, or the way he, he likes to go out to really enjoy himself, this, this version of a good time is to go a whole day to the supermarket in Singapore and spend his time there, spend some money there and then come back and that was a good day for him. I learned something from that, that he does learn to enjoy life. So I always say, see, see, you know, see, <laughs> and, yeah. and when he orders durian, he orders them by the basket cook. He loves durian, but I don't. <laughs> when he orders satay, he orders them by the dozen. <laughs> he really enjoys life. <laughs> and I learned that life is serious, but it must not be taken so seriously that you die of anxiety. I call senior says, life is too serious to be taken seriously. <laughs> we must learn how to relax and enjoy life too. But there were some things that I wish that he was, that I had more. Number one, I wish that he could show me more affection. I never received a hug in my life from him. Never heard him say that he loved me, although I knew he did. He, he did. And those are some things that were lacking that I wish that he had. Maybe I would have grown up to be a slightly better personality when I was a teenager or when I was becoming an adult before I was renewed like I am now. Uh, maybe I would have approached life differently. Maybe some of the problems that I had would not have been there if he had been more physically affectionate. That I wish I had. Number two, I wish I had more playtime with him. He was always working, and uh, and uh, he, I, I wish he had played more with us. Uh, I wish that I could have joked with him and laughed with him. And uh, the only playtime I had that I remember was when he took me to the police headquarters on a Friday, which was an off day, and that in, those, in, in Johor at that time. And uh, he took me with him to play table tennis with him his colleague. Co colleague. And uh, so I enjoyed that, and uh, uh, so I, I remember that uh, uh, we had very little play time. I wish he had more time that he could play with me. And as I look through all this, I wonder for some of you whether your own children could be wondering that. I know my children don't because I do have play time to them. And uh, uh, maybe your children are wishing in their heart, I wish Daddy would play with me more. Don't wait until your great grandfather is king. Too late, your children are too big. They have their own children there. And uh, thirdly, what do you have to go here? Oh, yes. I wish that he had teach me more. He had instructed me more. He had talked to me about the things of life. I wish he had. Maybe because he was not really in that line, uh, so he didn't, but I wish he had. Even if he was not a super intellectual guy, maybe he could just give me some words of wisdom from time to time. Not necessarily in a classroom situation, to sit at a small lesson time. <laughs> but maybe as he travel in a car, maybe as he go along, maybe he could share with me some words of wisdom. And uh, then he do not really. And I wish he had. All of us have fathers, some of us uh, have fathers for a short time. Some of us may never have a, had a father at all. But all of us could be thankful for some things that you have had. And maybe you wish for some things that you do not have. But for all of us who are fathers, we can make the difference now in the lives of your children. 
Maybe for some of you much older in the life of your grandchildren. Or some of you started to be in the life of your future children. And there are five roles that are listed down that a father needs to do. The role of a father. Some you already know, I'll just repeat them. Number one, let's look at the book of Ephesians. Chapter 6, verse 4. And you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonishing of the Lord. Isn't it interesting that in verse 1, 2, and 3 he talks about both parents, and in verse 4 he singles out their father. Children, he says, obey your parents in the law, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. And then suddenly in verse 4, he singles out the father. He says, And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Number one, five roles of a father. It is the role of a father to discipline. That role is not given to the mother, although sometimes mothers as delegated authority and representatives where the father is absent, maybe on a work assignment or on a, a, a occasions when uh, they can't be there or the time lapse is too long, there is delegated with permission from the father to the mother to discipline the child but it is the role of a father to discipline their children. God has made fathers to be the disciplinary gate. If children are disciplined by the mother and not by the father, they will grow up with a very queer personality. There will be a funny slant to their personality. It is produced by them not having a strong disciplinary father. And in fact, some of them may uh, have a wrong uh, perception when they grow up in life. A lot of men who grow up to be sissies have very weak fathers and have very domineering mothers. And so they grow up like a tree or a flower or plant that has been injured so they are not brought up properly. The Bible gives the disciplinary role to the father. Why is it so? God has made the man and the woman emotionally different. Men tend to look at the overall picture. Ladies tend to look at the specific picture. And, uh, and discipline needs to be a given usually in an overall situation and not a reaction in one situation. And this thing needs to be consistent. Therefore, God has given that role to the Father. And fathers, if you have not played a role in your house as a discipline master in your home, you need to take up that role. Don't leave it to your mothers because then your children will have a wrong impression of, of the mother. The mother's role is different. The mother's role is, it is a role uh, of, of, uh, of a nurse where that they turn to. And uh, yet many children grow up and this is not established, looking at their mother as a dominant tyrant and looking at their father as pictures of comfort. It is wrong. It is the father who must take the rule and the rod in the, in the house. And uh, don't leave that uh, to to your wife. It would cause the children to grow up with a warped personality. That's the first rule. And uh, I believe that that rule is given because men are less given to emotions than women. And discipline should never ever be given with uh, too much of uh, emotional slant. It must be given more from a principal plan. 
uh, discipline without instruction doesn't do anything at all. And it is the role of a father to discipline with instruction without emotion. Uh, and a child that does something wrong needs to be told what they do wrong, why they are doing it wrong, otherwise they cannot change. They will keep on doing the same thing. Uh, there's a little girl and, and there's a, uh, one of our Christian friends and uh, the little girl keeps pulling, on, pulling the curtain. And uh, so, uh, she was told not to pull the curtain. Don't pull the curtain. Mm-hmm. And after a while, she will do it again. Don't pull the curtain. She do it again. Uh, mother gets upset. And uh, so is her. Don't pull the curtain. After a while, she pulls the curtain. Now, is she going to stop pulling the curtain because she's afraid that she'll be shouted at? Or whether she will understand why she should not? Which is a better way? It's much better that that a child understands she should not pull the curtain because of a reason than because of the fear of being shouted at or being threatened at. And let me explain. There are many children being disciplined and outwardly they are obedient they are obedient because they are afraid of your punishment. They are obedient because they are afraid of you shouting at them. They are obedient because of, the, of, of being terrorized by you. But they don't understand why they have to be obedient. When they are teenagers, you are going to have a problem because they are going to rebel. It is harder to train and instruct children why they should not do something because they take more patience you got to explain it many times and so this friend of ours in the end he told the child he says do you know why you should not pull the curtain the child said no she doesn't know because when you pull the curtain that curtain will drop on you the curtain will to drop on you you may be injured things will happen and they got to repair the curtain do you know why now yes and she never pull the curtain again so when you tell your children and they come to church, sit down, sit down, quiet, quiet, do they know why? Or are they just doing it because they are afraid you terrorize them? It's the wrong way of discipline. Don't get your children to do what you want them to do just because you don't want to do them to do what you want them to do. <laughs> what you don't want them to do, right? They need to know why. And sometimes in the process they may be a little bit uh, off key and you've got to keep tuning them until they arrive on target. The father must take the role. Many times it's the wife who tells the children, no, 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 and and the father will be going around. And uh, perhaps uh, the child is misbehaving and uh, mother will be there frantic. I don't know why lady should be frantic, but we do. And, uh, have you ever heard of a man going hysterical? Never. Right. But have you ever heard of a lady going hysterical? Yes. Right. right. And, and then the man is just standing there, you know, like, like, like nothing is happening. You know? And he is not playing his role. He should take his place to be the discipline master in a home. Because children naturally respect the man in a home more than the lady. It's a natural thing that God has placed in them. And that is what God wants a father to take that role. Don't leave that to your mother. Fathers play that role. Of course, for those of you who are single parents, and uh, you may have to take that role to a certain ex- extent, but when you do explain that it's because there is no choice, and you have to take that role, and uh, that will help the children too. And of course, the children probably, a church is a good place, a family church is a good place, where they will find father figures within the body of Christ, the family of God, that they could relate to. Secondly, 
uh, it's found in Ephesians 6 here, but we want to look at the book of Proverbs. Proverbs supposedly is written, a lot of them, by Solomon. We state in chapter 2, we record possibly the words that David taught Solomon. My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you, so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding, yet you will cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding. You seek her as children and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord. I am not. In uh, chapter 1, verse 8, is the same, My son, hear the instruction of your father, and do not forsake the law of your mother, for they will be graceful ornaments on your head and chains about your neck. Verse chapter 3, verse 1, My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my command. For length of days and long life and peace, they will add to you. Number 2, it is a father's role to give instruction. Doesn't mean that, that as a father you need to know everything. Because maybe, uh, maybe you are a mechanic and you are not a person given overly to uh, uh, intellectual areas. Maybe your wife is a biology teacher and maybe she could explain something better than you. Then you could channel the explanation of certain things to her. But no matter how and where you stand in life, you could be like me, you just were who could, who could have principles of life. I mean, we're not talking about a scientific father who is able to explain the difference between uh, the atoms and uh, all the crops and everything. We're not talking about that necessarily, that you could channel here and there. But any man who succeeds has developed principles of life. You could, even if you're mechanic, you could have it in your own way. You could turn to your son one day, if your son is washing the car, and you say, son, remember all your life. There can only be one driver for a car. But you could put it in your own words, your own mechanic words. You could be a farmer. And you could say, son, remember, the hardest times in life are the greatest potential. Like a seed that is thrown into the ground. And the hardest times are the first few moments that you don't see the seed. You don't know whether it has died or it has born to stay on the ground. You must have that patience. You could draw from your vocation in life. It is the father's role to instruct their children in the wisdom that they have in life. For all young people need not just to learn knowledge. They can learn knowledge from school. They can learn knowledge from books. But they can never learn the wisdom of life except for one experience in life. And it is the role of a father from time to time to take aside their children. Or maybe in things that they are doing together and saying, Son, it's a something people say. And something could be a problem, an issue, and you use that as a teaching to explain principles of life to them. Because principles of life need to be in, in, imparted to the children. And the father must take that role. In my own life, I wish my father had taught me some of those things. I could learn those things from books, from the Bible. It's a long, longer way, and then you got to learn those things from your own experience in school or hard knocks. How nice if you learn from someone who is more experienced than you in life, who could share some of those nuggets of wisdom. Turn to the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis. And, uh, these are the statements God made about Abraham, chapter 18. 
Verse 18, Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. Notice it's Abraham's role, not Sarah's role, to instruct, to teach, to command. It is the father's role to instruct their children. When the father does not, the children will be rebellious. I have noticed that rebellious young people come from absentee fathers. The father may be there, but they are just absent from their lives. They do not play a key role in forming their children. Even sometimes when you have a good mother, maybe the single parent situation, without that father role, there is a rebellious streak in that child that can only be disciplined and done by a father instructing because to put it in a very rough way, they have what we call man talk. Man to man. It is something that, that only the father can play a role. For single parents, uh, where the father is an absentee, remember to encourage your children to a father figures in the body of Christ at large. And then they can give them what they call a man to man talk. And, uh, cause, cause all children and all sons are little men growing up and they have a male ego that needs another man who understands life to instruct them. Somehow or other, they don't want to take it from a lady. They don't want to take it from uh, another, uh, a woman or another lady. They want to hear it from a man. They start to go around and say, Hey man, this is good stuff, man. They don't want to take it from a man. Even though the man could say the same thing he said, it sounds different to them. It just sounds different. And uh, in the book of uh, First Samuel, we see an absentee father. He was present in the flesh, but absent in the soul. His name is Eli. And he's still actually doing the wrong thing. He doesn't tell them. He doesn't teach them. He just says, you know, he just says, hey, hey, if you keep doing this, this is what happens. He doesn't teach them. He doesn't instruct them. And God held him responsible to instruct his family. If there's any role given to the father, it's the role of number one, correction. Think about it. Everyone in life has been corrected because no one is perfect. No one is perfect means that all of us are on the way to perfection. All of us on the way to perfection means all of us need correction at times. Do you notice that the best correction comes from those who love you? It is far better to be corrected by your own daddy, your own father, than to be corrected by anybody else in the world. Children can take it. But if you are hearing the correction from anybody else, it's different. God has given to fathers a special role. Your second role is to instruct your children. Teach them in your own way the things that you learn in life. One of the things that my children love, you know, the different stages, they love different things. They love puppet shows at one time, they're outgrown that. And, and then we went into a different thing sometimes before they sleep. They love to hear stories of our life. So which story would you like? So which, which story from our life would you like? And, and they love to hear stories from your life. And to those stories, you could tell those stories and tell them the things they've learned. And they will learn from your life. That's the second role of a father. And uh, instruction includes, of course, building a family altar and spiritual headship. Number three. In the book of Ephesians chapter 5, in, in calling the men the head of the family, now the head must also be protector. The head must be protector. Just as Christ nourished 
the church, the head must nourish the whole family. Number three, the father is called to protect the family. To protect the family from the things that are outside. From forces that will destroy the home. The father is called to do the battle. He is also called to be a great leader, which is point four, he is a provider. But in point three, he is the protector. He needs to protect the women of the house, he needs to protect the children, he needs to fight the battles for the family. Headship means protection. Headship means the other head, they come under your wings for protection. That's an important role that sometimes fathers fail to play a role in. When a home is being attacked, when a children is being attacked, when a wife is being attacked, when the mothers are being attacked, whether physically or by words, the man of the house must stand up and say, if you want to attack, attack here, man to man. Which is why, if anybody attacks the children, my wife, I will say, that's not a fair fight, come over here. It is important that the husband, the father, be the head, and when you are the head, where did God put the mouth? On your head, in front. The head must be the spokesman. Must be the spokesman. And so, if anybody attacks, you must stand up to clarify. You're not being a busybody if your children get into certain situations. And you need to clarify, there is a protectiveness that you need to take away. Oh, don't leave your children defenseless. Don't tell your teenage children, and they're having some problems there. A lot of parents say, that's your problem, you go and sort it out. Irresponsible. You have a good father, you will set in. If your children are wrong, you point to them where they are wrong. If they are right, point to where it's right. And you take the role, you come among the friends and you say, look here, I'm going to come in and mediate. You're not coming to just defend where your children are always right, all the other children are always wrong, because that is wrong. The children are not always right. But it's important that a father comes in as a protector and say, look here, if you all want to pick a fight, let's sit down and see what the fight is about and, uh, and watch uh, your children. Your children get into problems with their friends, parents, don't just have a Tita Appa attitude. Call your friends, call your sons, call your daughters and say, look, I'm going to quote unquote interfere because if it gets out of hand, you need a hand. And a lot of teenagers are wondering why their fathers do not help. Maybe your children come and say, I'm being bullied in school, I'm being bullied in school. You write it off. You're not protected. You say, ah, rubbish. Have you investigated? Have you asked? Have you found out? Now, sometimes it could be one-sided. Sometimes it could be wrong-sided. But what they want to see, this is what they want, want to see you as a father. They want to see you riding on a white horse. It, it, it is not just a single woman or single lady who wants to see their bridegroom to be coming on a shining white armor on a white horse to deliver them. Da -da -da -da. They fall in love and then dang 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 dang. No. Secretly in the hearts of all the children. They just want to see whether that lion of Judah, a different lion of Judah in the home, 
is Jesus the Lion of Judah. Incidentally, of all the things, I, I, I like this Lion of Judah. It looks, looks nice. Lion's name. Uh, all of them are nice, but I especially like that. Ooh, Lion of Judah. Good. Secretly in their hearts, the children, if you watch them, what they want is when they get in the problem, they want to see their, their father like a white knight coming, charging. Yes, still at you. And you could see that tiny smile come out of the children's smile. Even if it's just a small matter, you could say, ah, oh, daddy is here, papa is here. They want to know that. They want to feel that. Some, maybe because they're not satisfied that you're fulfilling your role as a protector. And they need that satisfaction to know, hey, if you mess around with me, you don't mind them. And, uh, and if you find some teenagers talk that way around and tell you, mess with me, mess with my daddy, the other teenagers are like, ah, she's the next moment of it's important that you know this. And it doesn't mean that you just come and claim that your children is right all the time. But it means that you come to be a mediator. See, even in the smaller things, I mean, all children when they grow up, they fight, they fight, they make mistakes, they quarrel among each other. It's alright. If your kids fight with my kids, that's okay. Hallelujah. Does that mean you don't love you anymore? No. But, it's good that we're able to come in and you notice all the time. If it comes to a situation, if it's our own leader will come and discuss with you, let's find a way to solve our children's problem. Children, a lot of parents are negligent. The children find they say, oh, they are killing away, and that's all. And if it's once in a while, you know it's just a temperament. But if consistently the children are having problems, you should get together and say, all right, we know, we're not going to put a blame on one another. But we're going to discuss and say, it's both our children that are at home. Let's seek a way to solve the problem. And when the two children see their steady discussing, they are going to be different. They know that when they fight, it's going to be now World War III. Because <laughs> the parents are coming in. They're not going to fight easily now. They, they know it's safer. A lot of parents are not playing the role of a protector. I mean, my children fight in class once in a while. When my children come and cry, and I tell them, I say, look, don't fight yourself. Next time, come and tell daddy. Now, I know that he sometimes may be the one who's wrong. But I want him to know that daddy will be there to defend and protect him. Although when he's wrong, daddy will tell him he's wrong. But what the child needs to know is, will daddy be there? Will he be there to protect? And I tell him, it's not right. Daddy will talk to the other church member. We will discuss it. Now, I never get to because it's not necessary. It's just partly their fault. <laughs> but you know, for my son, that's pleasure. Ah, enough. Enough. You know that daddy is interested in his father. To know that one day when he meets a tiger, he can't fight. Daddy lion will come. Chase the tiger away. The daddy must be the protector. Hallelujah. The head is the protector. The spokesman, the negotiator. So let's discuss it out. Amen. And of course, it is not. It should not take take that point seriously to say you're always right and all the others are wrong. Because it's funny, every parent always thinks that their children are right. Hallelujah. Praise God. It's just like just now in the act just now. I'm proud of my son! Your daughter, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. So, it's, it's possibly a, a, a natural thing. And when we go spiritually, we realize the most important things in life are the Bible and the principles and God's kingdom. And when our children don't throw the line, we get them to throw the line. But the wonderful thing is, if you can get the parents sitting together at a round table, that will solve a lot of problems. And sometimes parents don't want to get involved. Surprisingly, the children got problems, and the problem involves different, different children. 
and then some of the parents will be willing to sit together but other parents you know what the children are going to grow up knowing that their parents are absentee fathers they're not going to be protected now protection has nothing to do with being right or wrong your children can be wrong your children can be right protection has to do with the element of when I'm in danger will you be there if I make a mistake and wander into the jungle where so there are wild elephants and tigers attacking me, who will you be there? If I make a mistake and quarrel and jump off a boat and get drowned and are drowning, will you be there? It is a question of Jehovah Shama. It's a question of Daddy Shama. Jehovah Shama God will be there. It is not a question of Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is my banner. They are always right. You are always winning. Nobody wins all the time. But it's a question of Daddy Shama. Will Daddy be there? And when they know that you will be there. You will be there to fight over their problems. You will be there to discuss over their problems. It makes a difference. Father, say Daddy. Father, say Daddy. Will always be there. That's what your children need to know. And uh, sometimes that's really true. I mean, we have two children and they sometimes fight in fast. And sometimes a long distance. And all I have to say, and then they require me, and I may not be back for four or five hours a whole day or, or two, I say, when I get home, I will deal with those problems. Guess what? the fight between the sister and her brother stops because they know daddy is going to come and it's satisfying it is not a question of daddy Nisi it's a question of daddy Shama he will be there and uh, that's important will daddy be there the children will be asking that question to find out whether you are the protector of course, not forgetting a uh, point that all of us know. In the book of First Thessalonians, the first point, Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 7 and 8. So you yourself know how you ought to follow us, so we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat another anyone's bread free of charge. But what we labor and toil night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. In 11, for even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busy bodies. Now those who are such a command and exhort to our Lord Jesus Christ, that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. Number four, daddy must be a provider. He must be able to bring the bread home, to provide for the home. And uh, fathers, if, if you're not doing your role as a provider and you're leaving it to the mama, your children will have a very funny attitude towards you. Your children will grow up looking at you with one kind eye. And when your children grow up and small looking at you, one kind eye, they go out to the world, they become one kind eye. The people look like, why are your children so different? Because you are not being a good example to them. I mean, many times when, I, when, when you counsel thousands and thousands of people, you see people of different personalities, and sometimes you say, God, I'm sure you never make people that way. But they became that way. A lot of it is in the family life. When the children grow up and see mama working hard, Mama bring the bread home. All daddy do is drink and smoke. Watch TV bought by the mother. Records bought by the mother. Shoes bought by the mother. Anything bought by the daddy, nothing. Where does he spend all his money on his smoking, on all his kissing? The children are going to grow up. Either they will hate men. Or they will grow up with a strange, queer personality. 
they will need adjustment in their adult life. But when children have a good daddy that provides for them, they are proud. You know, a lot of, of families where the, where the father are not great winners, the children are ashamed. Who taught them to be ashamed? It's a natural thing. They're not ashamed. Because they know that something is not right in the home. And as a result, sometimes the daddy doesn't get the respect that he needs in the home. Now, realize that in, in modern society today, sometimes it takes two to earn the bread enough to eat. To run a modern home. But yet, the man must work hard. I remember in my early family life, I mean, my father earned work as a clerk and they only got a few hundred to feed a family of eight. And uh, to earn the extra money, my mother had to uh, open a little stall and I remember when they sell what we call the bak chang and uh, in, a, in the home and, and uh, they would take it and, and my mother was quite an uh, ideal woman. She would uh, buy eggs from the wholesaler and sell eggs. So my, my father got involved in that and, and uh, they would buy eggs maybe at 10 cents and sell it for 15 cents and uh, my house they are full of eggs. They buy them by the crib and they sell them. And, and my father in his office is known as Tao Ke Talo. Because he'll take those eggs to sell to. And my, my mother, although she was not educated, she had some ideas too to, to go about certain things. Was I ashamed of that? That was not enough? No. I'm proud of the fact that my father did his best. But if he's smoking, drinking, and just watching TV, not lending a hand in the home and family, all the money he earns is his, and all the money mama earns is everybody, something is wrong. It's not just the amount you bring in, but it's that you work hard at it. I mean, I know my wife's family is, is a rubber tapper, it doesn't earn much. But one thing you did, he was hard working. He provided. What he came with his bad hands. He didn't have an education, so he can't get the work an educated person can. I'm sure she'll be proud that her daddy had worked hard. Every child is proud of a hard working daddy and ashamed of a lazy daddy. As long as you're the breadwinner, you provide. And if your home is not structured in that way, things need to change. And if, if your wife works, not that how family income, well and good, but make sure your wife works that she keeps a greater portion than you. You know why? Because the ladies, no matter some of professional women, I mean, she work hard, she comes back, after work from 9 to 5, come back, she got the washing to do, she got the cooking to do, she got this to do. She's actually working two jobs. One job paid, one job unpaid. <laughs> Not a very sad situation. And it's important that, that all babies need to pray that God will enable you that one day you can be the sole breadwinner and your, your wife, the mother of the home, can be a full-time mother who bring all the children up. This is why when, when we make a decision in our home, and I told my wife, I said, Look, you have a call into the ministry. I recognize that. I have a call. But we both cannot fulfill the call at the same time when we have children. If we do, our children will be neglected and we are both going to be sorry. And not only that, sorry has no cure in the future. You can't set the clock back and make the children grow small again. So, I'll do the ministry, but you be the home affairs minister and until the children are big. I'll begin to take on more and more the role of the instructor and then you'll be set more and more free to do your ministry. And although each person, each person brings out their family in a slightly different way, our major principles are the same but there are some principles that each one has their own way of saying things. We, we need to give one another the allowance. We have ours too. And, uh, and, and I make sure my, my children have, 
and it's all essentially need in the first five years. People may disagree and say, oh, there's too much attention. And my children are very attached to the mama. Very. They're kind of small. And some people who don't even have children think that it's wrong. But wait, we have our own philosophy. Let us do it our way, it's our children. But what was I doing? I wanted our children to feel that security daily for five years in their We had our own principles to develop. And, uh, and I know some people are different, they bring out their children from small, they chuck, they call chuck away children. Chuck them. You know? And say, pass it to someone, pass it to someone, pass it to someone. That's not what I believe. I believe the children need to be loved and given all the attention they need for the first five years. Development too. I mean, it's okay if they're stuck to you for 24 hours. Your children are going to come one day, hallelujah. <laughs> he was supposed to preach today, but he came to me and said, Father, right. So he's not a father yet, right? So, praise God. And, uh, so some people say, it's wrong for the children to be stuck to you for 24 hours. Who said that? Who said that? Dr. Spock? From Star Trek or what? <laughs> Who said that? If you read in the Bible, the Hebrew children are weaned for two years. Two years, they, they were breastfed. Today they may tell you, best feeding is only for the first nine months. For the twelve months. After that you must get them on a formula. Otherwise they will not grow normally. They are measuring it on the nutritional value. They didn't measure the emotional value of the closeness that a child has. Do you know that children who are not touched and cuddled grow up with queer, queer personality? Twisted personality. So it's okay. If nobody in the world does it that way, let's do it the way we believe is right. And of course, people are wondering, will they ever get unstuck? What happens if they're 21 years old and they're still stuck? Mama, mama. I feel when I find that they don't. Because as they grow, then I begin to allow my wife to go out. Now she's coming for overnight prayer. And I take turns to her and I say, you go for overnight prayer, I go for the Saturday prayer. And uh, when I go for the overnight, you go for the Saturday, so that she doesn't miss it. And then sometimes when we are standing up, and uh, I realize that I could see in the seminar, I say, no, you go, I'll babysit. Instead of some of us, who put spiritual father. More like turkey. <laughs> Your poor wife, who has been spending so much time on the uh, on bringing out the children, hardly has time to do devotion because best feeding, nursing, washing, washing your dirty stuff, your dirty clothing, cuts, dirty pampers, and all these things, and uh, taking care of the house cleaning and everything, and she hardly has devotion at she's struggling and everything, and then every time there's a Bible family in there, she says, There you stay home, I'm going, that more spiritual. And she's starving for spiritual food. I tell you, we fathers, we need to take time and say, Look, why don't you go and enjoy the seminar? And it's time we do this thing. Of course, there is a difference between fathers do it and mothers do it. My <laughs> wife always tell me that. <laughs> when we fathers do it, the mothers come back to God, we have got to do it. And uh, she used to tell me my baby is very easy. <laughs> All I do is beat my children out. <laughs> We we'll walk and walk and walk and walk. <laughs> look and look and look and look. <laughs> and then we come back and uh, we we'll play and play and play. So we get tired. And uh, then we may watch a little video together and then they fall asleep. But my children love it. The first time I did it, I remember the first time I did it. And uh, my, my son was, I could see, he's a bit anxious. Mama's going to be away for half a day. So I could sit down and plan what to do. 
I know. So I make sure he's occupied. <laughs> I know. So he's occupied, and, and then when he came to, uh, and he really enjoyed himself. And uh, we planned. First thing we have what I call committee meeting. My daughter is a secretary. Agenda, what are we to do? And then they write down. And, they, and, they, and um, let them write down because why? It takes half an hour to one hour to write the agenda. <laughs> By that time, one hour is gone. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. <laughs> so they will do the drawing and all that. And then my son will be excited. He keep the agenda in his pocket. When we go to the supermarket, pull out the agenda. What's the next agenda? Go to bookshop. Okay. Right. And say, next agenda is bookshop. Say, sorry. And say, oh, eating time. Right. He loves that. And uh, so after he did that for the first time, he came to me and said, when is Mama going away again? <laughs> Where is the Lord? I must have did something right. When is Mama going away again? <laughs> so now, now he's so gay. Sleep, you know, at first he's all done stuff with her, but now he's, he's okay. He's slowly grown up. But the way, this one of the principles. All children need close affection. And uh, let the children be the one who draws away from you. Not you draw away from them. There is a natural drawing away that you, you can find. The children, they want. By the time the teenagers, huh, they don't want you around. Don't come into my room. My privacy. Privacy. Don't worry, there will come a time when they will want to be by themselves. But the thing is, they know. When they need daddy and mommy, they are there. It's important that fathers know how to provide for their family. And it's a mother who's working so hard and all these things. And, and I recommend that you, for, for you men, and every time you have a father standing out or everything, guess who attends the daddy? And sometimes the whole family attends together. And so you have the daddy, and the daddy is sitting in the front seat, taking notes, opening his $150 Bible. The mother is somewhere at the back, somewhere because he's running. And she will be trying to take notes and open her $10 Bible. And you know, once in a while, the child will run to the front and uh, right next to daddy, and daddy will Pretend that's when he starts. <laughs> my mama will run up. Come on. For the lady to attend the seminar, they still didn't get anything because they're running up, still taking care of the children. We daddies must play our role too. Take turns once in a while. Stay home with the children. And you say, well, what will I do with the children? You have never done that before. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Hallelujah. Maybe we should change it. Repent for the family of God is at hand. Your children need to know you. They need to be close to you. Give your wife a chance. Daddy, you need to provide well so that your mother, the mommy can be with the children. And you, you notice know, that when, when children don't have daddy, and daddy goes to work, or sometimes they can take it. But when daddy goes to work, mama goes to work, they feel it. They don't tell you, but they feel it. And my children are happy with that. I think one of you is with that. Now we have offers before. We have offers, you know, people say, hey, you know, you two just go have a good time, and we take care of children. But but we have a good time with the children. <laughs> no problem with that. And uh, we know that the time will come and the children will grow big and they'll be independent and that's, that's different. But we need to provide for the children. And I would recommend that some of us fathers, you need to do that. Give your wife a chance to grow spiritually. Just time for God. And uh, you don't have time to stand in now. You stay back with all the children, you know. <laughs> right. And uh, be your daddy to them. And uh, let your wife grow. Hallelujah. Just make sure when she comes home, the house is still there. 
Praise the Lord. Although the house may be different. Hallelujah. I remember the first time my wife came by after I did this kid. And the house was different. Furniture rearranged, right? Both spread missing. Pillows all over the house, right? So what has happened? Look at tornado has been through the place. That's no tornado. It was daddy somehow. Right? It's important that daddy provide for the home. And I know that sometimes uh, you're not at a level where you could provide well. And I would suggest this. If both of you are working, if the daddy cannot provide well, and if you're young enough to still study, study and press on even while you work. Take night classes, pursue your, your way, uh, and, and, and rise up in life that God has for you. If you're called of God, then slowly move into that as God provides. But remember, you've got to do everything you can to be a good provider. If education stands in the way, then get it past you. If, if a skill that you need to learn is in the way, get it past you. That it is all, all things are possible until you reach a degree that you are able to be the sole breadwinner and your family to be the way God wants it. And you can speak to every working woman and most of them in their heart, they would really love to be with their children. Now I realize that there are some working professional lead, ladies who, who even the children don't feel like they are made for the home. Right? They would rather go working and take care of the family. That's more because they need encouragement and training from those who are more experienced. Remember this. Homemaking can be fun. Housekeeping can be fun. You can make what you do in life fun if you know how to do it and go about it. Babysitting can be fun. Hallelujah. Praise God. Can I have at least just one amen? Okay, thank you. So we have the last and final point. We have uh, uh, look at all the uh, various aspects. We have seen that the father is um, number one, the disciplined master, and uh, number two, the instructor, and uh, number three, the protector, number four, the provider. And uh, let's uh, continue to look at one last scripture. As we close, then we move first of all to the book of Galatians. Uh, chapter 4. Verse 1, it says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all. But if under guardian and steward, until the time appointed by the Father, even as we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world, but when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And become and because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your heart, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God to Christ. Basically, in these verses, it talks about the difference between bondage and liberty. Bondage and liberty. And the flow from bondage into liberty is a flow from guardians into fatherhood. The children are brought up under guardians, and then the children are brought up under fathers, and receive all the blessings that the father has 
the best soul for his children. And uh, and all these blessings include the the here it talks about the heavenly father and uh, how we have now from guardians under the law become sons and as sons we receive his spirit and uh, we receive the blessing and we receive the heir of uh, inheritance the heir of the inheritance of God and uh, number five the father must be the priest or the spiritual uh, revealer or the spiritual manifestation of God in a home that's an important role Jesus Christ was born in a manger but he was definitely not born to a godless family Jesus Christ was born in a manger to very poor parents we know they are poor because from the offering that they sacrifice the sacrifice for a male child when they circumcise is a, a lamb but the poor can sacrifice turtle dove it's recorded in the, in the law and they sacrifice turtle dove meaning that they are classified under the poor though they don't have much silver though they don't have much gold but they have spiritual inheritance God doesn't mind sending his son to a manger rather than a palace God doesn't mind sending his son to a home without much silver and gold God doesn't mind sending his son to a home that's unknown and without fame and recognition and outward success in the world but God does mind whether that home is godly or not the Bible records they were righteous before God and the fifth point is that the father must be the spiritual priest in a home he must be the man who reveals God in a home who teaches God and exemplify godliness in a home and bring the spiritual blessing when a daughter gets married normally who gives her away? the father sometimes if it's not possible somebody else to represent the father why the father? why not? have you ever seen a wedding where the mother gives the child away? because the power of the blessing the priest is in the hands of the father the father has a God given right and God given authority to bring blessing in the home and it's the father who must bless the home bless his children every night without fail I always pray for my family I always take all these all and annoying all my children and I will lay hands on them and anoint them and pray for their lives without fail because I know that I am the spiritual priest in a house who must pronounce a blessing on my home I must bless my family you know there is such a thing as blessing the family that's why the father must take on the spiritual role, the spiritual altar to bless the family pronounce the blessing, even if it's a simple blessing notice your children change disobedient children are only disobedient because they don't have strong gentle father you look at all the obedient children, obedient teenagers are well brought, you notice they have very strong father and almost instantly a disobedient child whose father plays the spiritual role well almost instantly the child becomes obedient check on me, check on my words, I've done research 
and I could even go on to say it. A hundred percent of all these obedience, the very few exceptions, are caused by the absentee father, the rebellious street in children. And sometimes, when the father is not playing a strong role, but all the father has to do is begin to take the spiritual role, lay hands on the children every day, pray for them, be the spiritual head and peace in the home, bless the children, watch the miraculous change in the home. Finally, father, you are called to be the spiritual peace and head in the home. Play your role well. You are the one who must bless your, your, your family. Your word will make a, a long difference in your children. I remember when I was growing up in a family of eight, my father who was not a believer yet, but there was something that he always said that I, I, I never forget it even up to today. And uh, he always said good things about me. And he always said, uh, that I'm the one who, who will go the furthest in my family. He, he didn't know he was making a positive confession. And he was always confessing that I'll go the furthest and I'll, I'll, I'll be the most intelligent and I'll be this and I'll be that. He didn't know he was confessing. The funny thing is, even up to today, I never forget this good thing that he said over me. Certainly, they must have affected me subconsciously and consciously. Fathers, you've got the power of blessing. Learn to bless your children. Exercise your right. Just like Christians who have the power of healing and you don't exercise it to bring healing. The power to cast out demons and you don't cast out demons. Isn't it a waste? God gives fathers the power of the spiritual headship and a prisoner home. If you don't bless, you may end up subconsciously cursing them. And that will be dangerous. Take that power out of the closet and use that authority God has for you. Bless your children. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you will continue, Lord, to work in our hearts and our lives so that we could be transformed and changed on this Father's Day where if the Father to take on the role that you have for them the family should be so much different Oh Father we want parents and especially daddies who are not just silent in the home and consenting we want strong fathers Although we want gentle Father. And we pray, O oh God, that you will stir up the heart of each father here. And stir up the hearts of the mothers in agreement, O oh God. That the children of this church and this place and those hearing under the sound of my voice will rise up to a good, godly parent. Because we are raising up the generation that will usher in the kingdom of God and the coming of Jesus. And we are going to raise up a standard, O oh God, the world does not have. We pray, Father God, that if there are any parents or fathers to your Lord, they are not playing their role. That your spirit, O oh God, will come, O oh God, and can weak and change and transform our lives. So that we would be the father we want us to be. The world cries for a father. Adult cry for Father Figure. Oh Father, there is a birth of Father Figures in the land. We pray, Lord, that you will raise up fathers and Father Figures in this church. For those who are single parents, for those who don't have a family background good and well brought, we pray, oh God, that they may find many Father Figures in this church, oh God. Fathers who will not abuse, manipulate, or take advantage of those who look up to them. But fathers who will nurture those who look up to them in the right way of the Lord. Heal this Lord upon the men here in this place so that you raise them to be a mighty man of valor. 
In Jesus' name, Amen. Praise God. Let's all rise together. Oh. Right, it's a baby dedication. We pray for that too. Has you seen the song, Abba, Father, let me be? And you ask the parents of the else who are to come. Parents are very easy, and it's a dream. Come, we'll pray for you too. And at the same time, we also want to pray for parents here. Maybe you want to pray for the children who are difficult to handle. You stand in proxy for them, or you want to come with them if they are here. Or maybe, man, God is dealing in your heart. And there's some things that you feel that you need to come strong in. Then we want you to come and stand here too. Right now, let's all stretch off our hands to this child. Chedariya kalamaha zikidariya lumabariya chedariya 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 nalamaha mariya chedariya shonalama chedariya churamasa Chedariya kama chedariya chalamasa Hey, Mary, a holy Mary, come by the master. Oh, Father God, we pray for this child, Joel. In the name of Jesus, oh, Mary, child, Lord, go up to be a part of the mighty move of this new generation, Lord. So I say in the kingdom of God, we pray for your spiritual impartation, oh God. We draw the bloodline around this child, surely, child, Lord, by the blood of Jesus. Let every gift and talent your back on this child be quickened and nurtured, O oh God, into fullness. And let your perfect will be established and preserve the spirit, soul, and body of this child, blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for the parents too, O oh God. Seal your great blessing upon their life, O oh God. Give them a greater grace, O oh God, upon their lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Hey, 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 my father, let me be. Can go high? Give me a key. Hey, my father, let me be. Yes, and yes, alone. May my will forever be. Fathers here that need more grace in your life, families, whether single parents or whatever, and you need father figures in your home, you pray for them. And we are to pray for those of you men who found that you got to be right up to be the father figures for for your family and for other families too. And also finally, we're gonna pray for those of you who have always cried for a father figure. God will have to reveal the Father heart of God to you and in the face of that in your life. And there will be wholeness in your life and change your personality to be the personality that God wants you to have. Hallelujah. Abba, Father, let me be yes. And you're alone May my will forever be Evermore 
personalities that you know about but you find it hard to change. And others have told you so. You know your problem? You don't have a strong father figure. And God says that if you will come and let him deal in your heart and reveal the father heart of God in you, then and only then will your heart be changed. You come and make it right with God. And there is a host of personality conflicts and problems that some of you may be having. You know the root? You never have a father to you. And God will be able to be healing in your life when He heals that in your life. In one moment, God can feel a vacuum without a father. God can do that. Only the Holy Spirit can. But if this is anointing today, come and receive a touch from God. something different. Those of you pastors, elders, or deacons who, who are fathers, you may not have been a perfect father, but you have been a reasonably good father. I want you to come, stand in front of this here, get a hold of the heart of God, and lay hands on this. And God will bring the inner healing that each one of them needs. To have a good part. Come, come, gentlemen, come here. Right now. Joshua, come. Some of you pastors, others, the deacons. Only if you are a father, right? Sorry for the rest of you, but uh, different anointing, right? <laughs> special grace, special anointing for different times. But uh, we need that to come and minister. Come right now. Yes. I mean, you don't know what it is to be without a father. I know what it is to be without a Christian father. It's bad enough. What happens to without a father? God needs to do a deep work in your life. Close your eyes, keep up your hands. 
They say you've been in the city because God is going to touch you. He's our Father here going to minister to you. Oh, Ricky, let me come back to Calabahas. Oh, yes, Lord, you are here. Touch. Even in the heart and life of each one of them. It's all right to try and eat if you are. You are doing, don't hold back, just let go. Because there will be God doing a work of healing in your life. Read on the service of Papa God. And I pray that you will find Father Figures in the church here. Who will stand strong and tall in that which God wants in your life.